Hey everyone, and thanks for tuning in. Jean, always good to see you. Jean is with Esther and Kevin. I know I'm gonna murder your last name right now, but <laughs> Verstreppen, am I, am I getting it close? And, and you are with Verstreppen Lab at the University of Leuven. So I really appreciate you guys being here today and sharing. Like I told you last time, anytime we can talk about beer and the value of artificial intelligence that can you know make your brewery even more valuable through that beer, it's a fascinating conversation to have. So I'm gonna turn it over to you to share your expertise today so we can all learn. Fantastic, thank you, Andrew. Um, and yeah, I'm uh, super happy to be back here. Uh, we had a session a couple of weeks ago, but I'm excited today to be joined by uh, by Professor Kevin Verstepe, uh, one of uh, the professors at the university that I graduated from as well. Um, and I think we met, it must have been three years ago, four years ago. Uh, we had a really nice dinner with some great beer uh, and talked about flavor and beer flavor all night. And I think we immediately kind of hit it off on our uh, our perspective and our vision on, on what flavor intelligence and insights and flavor should be. Um, and so I thought it'd be only fitting um, to have you to have you as a guest here and to let you talk a little bit about um, the research that you do in Leuven um, and about how Esther and and the Vestable Lab uh, already collaborate and and definitely will collaborate more in the future. So um, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Kevin, and let you uh, let you talk a little bit about your research first. Thanks, Jean, and thanks for this opportunity. Um, so yeah, you've given my introduction perfect. Um, on the on the next slide, uh, you can see the, lamp, the the members of my lab um, here in in Leuven in Belgium, and there's about 35 of them, um, and half of them use yeast as a model to study genetics and genomics. And don't worry, I'm not going to talk about that. We're really a yeast lab. Um, so the other half of the lab is more involved in, in applied projects in collaboration with industry. And Esther is now one of our uh, bigger and, and most exciting partners in this research. Again, most of the people try to make better beer yeast, which is not something I'm going to talk about today. I talk about that a lot, but um, we've started, as Sean was saying, uh, about three years ago, we really started getting into flavor and aroma research as well. And so I'll be sharing some of the things that we're doing on, uh, on that level with you today. Next one, Jean. So yeah, I said this. Next one. So um, we are a yeast lab, as I said, and one of the things we do, of course, is try to make yeast that, that uh, yield better or different aromas. So the lab is quite equipped to measure all kinds of aromas in beer. And I don't have to tell you, this audience, how complex beer aroma is, right? We're talking about thousands of molecules, some more important than others, that all come together to make beer aroma and flavor. Um, and as we were measuring continuously in high throughput, so many beers and measuring all their aroma compounds with, with various um, machines we have in the lab. Talking to Jean, it suddenly struck us that maybe we could do a bit more than that and just you know use it to see how well our yeast were doing. We started thinking about really scientifically mapping, trying to map the aromas of beer. And of course, some of these things are known. I don't have to tell you that if you have more isoamyl acetate, your beer is going to get some banana fruity flavors. Uh, 4VG will give you the clubs-like aroma. So we know a lot of these. But looking at the ensemble of, of hundreds of compounds and how they really make an aroma and how that aroma will be appreciated by various consumers, that is something we don't have. And we figured that artificial intelligence could be really the missing link between the two because at some point, uh, next slide please, um, beer aroma becomes quite complex, right? So there's, there's these flavor compounds from all kinds of ingredients and processes. And again, for this crowd, uh, those really don't need an introduction. Um, but it suffice to say that there's many of them, they're chemically very different, so you need lots of machines to measure all of them. But even if we have that knowledge, even if we have the concentrations of, let's say, 200 of the main aromas, it is still very difficult to predict from that how a beer will taste 
and maybe how we can make it better or how a consumer will like it. And so that's really the step that we wanted to take. Next slide, please. The problems we're facing with this, and, and this is just a very simple slide, but the, the major problems is that, problem is that these flavors are, or these compounds are not acting independently, right? You have synergy where one plus one equals three, um, or masking where one flavor masks the other, or antagonism where two compounds really can change or cancel each other out, or um, really change the overall perceived aroma. And there's a lot of these things happening in the background, and it doesn't have to be only one plus one. It can be literally 50 plus another three or so. Um, so it becomes an extremely complex problem very quickly. But then, on the other hand, we have machine learning and artificial intelligence really coming up now. And, and that technology is actually the perfect way to get at these difficult problems, right? You just feed the machine some input and output, and it will learn itself what the best relationships are between those. And we figured if we can get, get enough data from the chemical side and the tasting aroma side, we could connect the two using artificial intelligence. Next slide, please. And so that's exactly uh, what we're uh, trying to do here. Next. So about four or five years ago, we started really analyzing lots of beers, uh, measuring about 200, 250 uh, components, flavor, or the, the most important aroma components in these beers. Some of these actually are summarized in this book that we put out a year or two ago now. Um, so we had that data set, and in the meantime, together with Esther, we expanded it. We're now at 350. We're also doing some wines, actually. So we have quite a massive set of beers that we completely analyzed, which was a lot of work. And, and again, we're adding more to it. And all of those beers were also tasted by our panel, which was also a lot of work, but it's, a, it's more fun work. Um, so we have those two. And what we also have are a few uh, genius students. And, and the one in the lead here is Supinia, uh, who's really trained in, uh, in bioinformatics and artificial intelligence. She has a, a master's in artificial intelligence. So she started re really using this data to make these models. Um, and we don't have time to go into all of them. We can, we can now take the chemistry and, and predict many of the aromas. But the one thing I wanted to show you, and, and I think it's, it's a striking example. You can give Supinia now a beer, she will analyze it chemically, not taste it, not smell it, and then have her models predict how that beer will score either in a professional tasting panel or on websites like Great Beer. And the accuracy is getting to like, you know, 0 0.8, so 80% accuracy. So quite, quite, good it's probably as good as we're gonna get to be honest so we're now really it's, it's really working i guess that's what i'm saying we can now from the chemistry to some extent predict um how well a beer will be perceived and obviously there's personal preferences um so we will never get to 100 percent for sure and for certain things it's more difficult like mouthfeel is still challenging although you know at least we're getting something which is better than what we had, I think. Uh, for other things, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's doing particularly well. Next slide. All this chemical and scientific knowledge then also allows us not only to predict from the chemical analysis how a beer will taste and how it will smell and how it will be perceived, but it also allows us to scientifically map beers. And that's a bit what you see here. You can probably not really see it very well on your screen, but what you're seeing here is a 2D map with, with 250 dots on it, and every dot is a beer. And it's quite simple. The more close the beers or the dots are, the more similar these beers are uh, in their chemistry, looking at the 200 main aroma compounds. Um, and the map is also um, a bit more intelligent in the sense that there's directions to it. For example, the right bottom hand are more the hoppy beers, hoppy aromas, bitterness. So if you move in that direction, you get more bitterness. If you move the opposite direction, you get, uh, for example, fruitiness, malty aromas, I, I know are um, going um, northwest, if you will, on the map. Um, 
So the map really has meaning and, and it allows consumers or brewers to look at one of their favorite beers, for example, and say, well, I like this beer, but it would be even better if it would be a little bit more bitter. And you can then look on the map and find the beer in the set that is closest to your favorite beer, but this is just a little bit more bitter or less bitter or more fruity or whatever in a non-biased way. Um, so no interference from brands or, or opinions or hypes or whatever. This is just chemistry, right? And we think that is it's really cool that we can now do this scientifically and also allow uh, to find maybe blind spots, right? Things that even if we look at 350 beers from all over the place, Belgium, but also we have lots of US beers now, uh, we find blind spots. Maybe they're blind because they're not good. Um, that's definitely a possibility. But maybe they're just uncharted territory and, and, uh, and opportunities to be discovered. So, so that's uh, another thing we find exciting about this, this way of doing things. Next slide, please. It also allows you to dig a bit deeper into aroma and find things that, that have maybe not been found before. For example, you can, it's very simple in a way, uh, you, you can correlate all the different chemicals that we, uh, that we find and you can look for chemicals that are correlated. For example, when you see red areas in the graph here, those chemicals are positively correlated. And a good example are the acetate esters. If you have more isoamyl acetate, you're also more likely to have lots of ethyl acetate, which is something very really new. But there's some, some other ones that we're discovering um, that we didn't know about. And you also find the opposite. You find anti-correlations. So that's interesting to, to see why that is. Can we tear them apart? And, and would that be interesting? So we can start asking these questions. Next slide. But more interestingly, of course, you can correlate the chemistry with perceived aroma by humans now, right? Um, and so that's a little bit what this uh, artificial intelligence is doing. But those models are, are really black box. Um, so we, we can spell them out mathematically, but they don't really make any sense. Here, it's a bit more simple, looking only at one particular perceived aroma against every individual chemical so you don't really see the interactions so the predictions are not as good but it allows you to really connect at least certain compounds with certain flavors um, which again can be handy if you're lacking this or that you can see you know you can interpret your chemical profile and see maybe what's missing and, and then hopefully maybe uh, think about your brewing process or your ingredients to to try and uh, and change that and make it better next slide one example I can give you, because much of this is, is proprietary, I, I cannot zoom in too much on all the details, but one example that, I don't know, you ever thought about it for us, it was, it made sense, but I don't think ever, anyone ever reported it. We found a, uh, an interesting correlation between isoamyl acetate and 4VG, and it's a bit difficult to see here on the slide, um, but it comes down to the fact that 4VG, which gives you the cloves-like aroma, um, is actually really appreciated by consumers more when there's also lots of isoamyl acetate. So when you get fruity beers together with 4VG, consumers uh, seem to like it better. If you have high 4VG without the isoamyl, even in, in, in white beers or Hefeweizen beers, consumers, at least in blind tests, don't appreciate that aroma um, as much. So that was a, a cool finding that we that we uh, got from this data that I can share with you. Next one. Um, same deal here, but it's just a 3D map. Next. Um, and again, like I said, we can, uh, we can also just start predicting overall consumer appreciation. And then, of course, take the next step. Um, and, and for some beers that are maybe not optimal, uh, we, for example, we're doing it now for low alcohol beers, uh, which are some of them, I think, are, are quite good. Um, so I'm definitely uh, in, in the pro field of low alcohol beers. I know it's uh, contested. Um, but I think we also all agree that there's a lot of room for improvement still. And so with our artificial intelligence, we predicted a few compounds that uh, when added to um, low alcohol beers, they would increase the overall consumer appreciation. So we've just done it in the lab. We added these compounds, mixtures, various concentrations, and sure enough, we were able to really improve the uh, consumer appreciation. Very, very uh, obviously uh, triangle tests, uh, but it was really zero against 10. So there was no doubt. 
Of course, we're adding this in the lab. We're adding mixtures of pure chemicals. I'm the first one to admit that, you know, that's not what we want to do as brewers. In some cases, there's a few things we can add or easily manipulate. But of course, the biggest challenge is, is to translate that into the brewing process. Um, and, and that's, of course, the next step we, uh, we need to take. Next one. Um, I have, I think, two or three more slides uh, where I'm uh, just going to advertise a few other things that might be of interest to you. So I'm going to leave the aroma research for that. And I think Jean is going to talk a little bit more about what Esther is doing with it. Um, but I want to bring to your attention the fact that we have an, uh, an online uh, Science of Beer course. Some of you might know it. It's on the edX platform. It's a, it's a free platform, so anyone can register for these courses. Um, if you want a certificate, it's 99 bucks, which actually doesn't end up in my pocket, unfortunately. Um, but we, we think it's a, it's a great course for anybody who wants to dive into the science of beer. Um, it, it can be quite challenging. It really is science. It's, it's university academic level, if you will. Um, but it, it, uh, it, I think it's interesting for many brewers, craft brewers, but also I, I know many of the bigger breweries are also using it to train their personnel. And uh, if you really want to dive into the science of beer, we, we also here at the University of Leuven just started with a postgraduate in, uh, in brewing. And that one is really a full year uh, of intensive courses looking at the science of beer, going all the way from malt to uh, beer packaging, uh, the engineering, also the marketing a little bit, the business, and there's some hands-on uh, brewing courses as well. So that might again be of interest to some of you. Uh, that course is actually uh, co-sponsored by uh, AB InBev. They don't own the course, but they're helping us out. They're our neighbors here. Um, so it makes sense for them to, uh, to invest a bit in this uh, as well. Next slide. So this, this is the uh, online course that I was talking about, the MOOC that you can uh, register for. It's ongoing now and it will open up uh, after this round. It's going to open up freely so you can start uh, the course whenever you want. Uh, you can just find it on the internet or, or shoot me an email if you don't find it. Next slide. I think we're uh, pretty much through. Um, next slide. Um, yeah, the last thing uh, I wanted to say is that we also poured a little bit of, of this chemistry into this beer book that we launched uh, that you can get from Amazon. So uh, that for now is only 250 Belgian beers, but we're hoping to do the same for American beers. It depends a bit on, on you guys to, uh, to send enough beers to Esther so uh, we can get them analyzed and then maybe also put them in a book um, for US beers. All right, that was uh, my part. It's, uh, it wasn't maybe the most fluent presentation, but hey guys, it's, uh, it's after 10 in the evening here. So uh, I've already been having lots of beers, so I'll, I'll gladly give it to Jean. Thank you, Kevin. And this was uh, this was pretty amazing. So thank you for that. Um, I am just gonna start sharing again and start sharing the deck that I'll show. Um, and I'm happy and a little bit jealous in the meantime uh, that you already get to get to drink a beer, Kevin. I have to say it's kind of upsetting. <laughs> it's evening uh, in the world always, Sean. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> So I don't know, uh, just want to make sure that everyone sees the blue screen with the Esther logo. Is that true? Yeah, okay, perfect. So um, thank you, Kevin, again for that introduction. And it's the perfect setup for Mia because I think um, uh, what Esther uh, saw in the research that Kevin initiated and, and where we found each other was really in uh, adding that, that chemical and sensory analysis and all that scientific data into um, a way for brewers and retailers to get the best beers in front of the, the right consumer. And that's been uh, the mission of Esther in, in a broad sense. And just to give um, a little bit of insight on me as well. So I'm a, I'm a, a Belgian as well. Eh? So my, my name is Jean, I'm from Belgium, uh, studied food science in the University of Leuven, uh, had some experiences with uh, beer brewing in a different lab than this one, uh, which is yours, I think, Kevin. Um, but um, I did some some work in the beer brewing lab there. And of course, growing up, growing up in Leuven was, uh, for me, 
very simply growing up in in the fumes of Stella Artois, right? So so where I was young, and if the wind was coming from the right direction, we would uh, we would smell the malt and the the brewing process right in our doorstep. So uh, that's kind of what I grew up with, and where my passion for beer comes from. And later on, I, I've always been extremely um, passionate, passionate and, and intrigued by some of the stories that all the brewers have. And, and to me, the craftsmanship uh, is, is something that I, I really connect with uh, even today. And there is always these amazing stories about brewers uh, taking risks with their product and, and changing their product to their market. And I think um, the people at Lindemans are kind of a great example in the sense that um, they they wanted their beer to come to the U.S. Uh, at some point 40 years ago, and they started exporting it. And so, because their gueuse was um, was a beer that that's made with wild fermentation, uh, when they shipped it to the U.S. because of temperature changes. Um, all the, the caps uh, basically jumped off of their beer. And so they had to change the packaging. They had to change their entire process. And they basically started pasteurizing their beer as well, uh, just to make sure that they could ship it to the U.S. Um, and, and that's kind of where uh, the really you know, famous uh, framboise and, and the creek beer in, in the U.S. Uh, found their origin 40 years ago. And, and it's those stories about um, the challenges of you know, shipping to another country, of growing your markets, about finding your customer that, that are always very, uh, very triggering for me. Um, and on the other hand, another story that stuck with me, and I can't say which brewery it is, unfortunately, but but I was talking to a brewer a couple of a year ago, probably, um, in Belgium, and he said that he was um, his team was making uh, a new beer every month that for them was you know of high enough quality that they said, well, this should exist in the market actually. And then when I asked him how many beers he actually uh, you know, uh, put in the market, he said, well, basically one, one every five years. And, and so that, that whole notion of, you know, almost uh, 60 beers that, that don't find their place in the markets because the brewery thinks that it's too risky or he's not sure that there's going to be a market or that he's going to find that market. That was kind of, um, uh, one of the, one of the biggest triggers for me to, to work on Esther and to start with Esther. Um, and then definitely in the past year, and that's something that I want to just focus a little bit on, uh, we've seen that the world has changed, obviously, we all know that. Um, and, and that also means that the beer world is changing. And I'm sure you all are aware and, and that all of you have had a challenging 2020. Um, but, but we see changes in consumer behavior where a company like Drizzly that does the, the home delivery of beer uh, grew tremendously. Um, and, and also grew in, in order value. So they, they really became all of a sudden from something on the side, they became a model that, uh, that at least they believe is, um, is very sustainable, where they say that uh, over 20% of the, the total annual alcohol category is going to move online moving forward. And so from a business point of view, um, it does trigger, you know, a lot of a lot of opportunities, but also a lot of challenges. And, and as a brewer, um, what I've seen as well, talking to a lot of brewers is that, you know, the, the ones that have had the biggest challenges are the ones that are uh, very active in hospitality, that have their own tap room, they have their own brew pub, um, they, they probably are available in the bars and the restaurants around. And in hospitality is, is where people typically discover new products. And, and that's where um, these, these craft beers find their audience. And so a lot of craft brands um, have had to shift towards retail uh, which is not easy to do, of course. And so a lot of them have been searching for alternatives in e-commerce. And I, I added that little uh, two by two that, that was published by the Brewers Association that said that, you know, one of the things we've seen is that a lot of brewers are also thinking about doing direct to consumer and, and selling their own beer online. Um, but the, the big challenge with that is that for a consumer and from a consumer's point of view, the choice anxiety is still there. And so a consumer doesn't necessarily want more choice, but they want to be very confident in the choices that are presented to them. 
Um, and definitely in categories like beer or but wine as well, uh, it's always hard to find the product that you know you'll like because the, the products are so complicated and because you can't see in the bottle. And so when you move towards e-commerce, that problem only uh, only becomes more, more big and more complicated. And so that's when we started talking and, and thinking as well in, in about artificial intelligence and how artificial intelligence can, can, use, can be used for this. Um, and, you know, one of the things that I wanted to just give a quick intro in is like what artificial intelligence is and, and why we would use it and also what the challenges are. Um, and so basically the definition of artificial intelligence is that you try to mimic the human brain. Um, and so you try to help a, a person make decisions uh, using, using data and using algorithms instead of using our human brain. Um, and definitely when we talk about uh, you know, an, an e-commerce experience where you have, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of beers in front of you and you have to make a decision of what to choose and what to buy. Well, then we can immediately think about the, the human interaction version of that, which is the bartender, uh, the store associates, the, the beer connoisseur, um, the person who helps you in the restaurant, et cetera. And so what the artificial intelligence in this domain could mean is that we try to mimic that human interaction in a context where the human is just, is just not available. It's just not there. Um, I'm going to skip this one, but um, AI really started finding its way in a very, very rudimentary form when Amazon started making recommendations. And so I, I took this image from Amazon, I think it's from 10 years ago. I don't think they make this kind of recommendations now, um, where it is very, very simple, right? So you looked for a book that had the word Google in it, and so it's going to recommend you all the books that have the word Google the word Google in it. And that's the, the very simple version of it. Um, the Spotify version of that would be that you listen to Charlie Mingus and the algorithm is going to tell you, well, maybe you should listen to John Coltrane, for example. And it's uh, just because it's jazz. Um, but in, in the next years, um, this artificial intelligence really became more and more intelligent. And, then, and instead of just looking at some keywords, uh, the AI is now looking at every potential uh, piece of data that you can find. Um, and definitely when we talk about food, uh, there is more and more data available, data about products, just like, like Kevin explained, where we have this ability or this capacity to do a chemical and sensory analysis of all these products. But also on the consumer side, it's easier than ever to capture and gather information about what a consumer is tasting and, and how they like something and what they like about that, that product. So um, that's, that's really important. Um, the, the question then becomes, why as a brewer should I worry about this? Should I be thinking about using AI? Um, and I think the reason is um, that AI in, in a complex domain like flavor offers you as a brewer the opportunity to understand. Um, instead of having to make assumptions, instead of having to simplify because the information is so complicated, uh, because flavor is something that is that is very individual and that is that differs from every every individual consumer. Well, AI allows you to find patterns. AI allows you to find uh, to create understanding, to create insights that you can use for your decision making. And definitely, in in the complexity of flavor, uh, that makes even more sense to to work with that. Um, there's also a couple of problems with AI, and I don't want to shy away from those. And so a first problem is the, the notion that AI leads to convergence and leads to more of the same. And you see that in a lot of recommender systems today is that the, the, the AI is still relatively dumb. Um, and it's, it's going to look at some very high level category data um, and it's going to tell you, well, if you like IPAs and you have a pattern of buying IPAs, it's going to tell you, well, I have an IPA here for you. Just drink that. Right. And so the, the challenge for us is to build um, models and, and to build AI that goes beyond that. And that really helps you as a consumer uh, to have that exploration, to have that, that you know, discovery and, and find joy in that. Um, 
which is possible, but it is not how most AI is programmed. Um, a second big problem is that if you want to make good insights, um, it is that uh, you need good data. And it's a, the principle of garbage in, garbage out, right? So if you have very poor data, uh, you're going to get very poor insights. And so it is a challenge for us and as a company and, and also the reason why we exist is to build the best models and build the best AI, yes, but also to have access to the best data. And that means doing those chemical and sensory analyses uh, just because they provide us with the, the most actionable insights. And then when I, when I jump to flavor intelligence and the importance of ad, uh, adopting AI to, to go into flavor, um, one of the biggest observations that really struck me was that the observation that um, it's, it's made by Nielsen a couple of years ago, that around 85% of new product launches in, in consumer packaged goods, um, they fail. And so a year later, they have to take the product back out of the, the assortment because it, it just didn't work. And it's only a, a, an indicator of how little we know um, as uh, companies, as, as producers, about what consumers are really sensitive to, what is going to pique their interest and what is going to um, help them find, you know, help them enjoy something. Um, and the reason is, in, in a lot of cases, is that we just don't have the right data. Um, and so if I, if I ask a typical a random brewer, like what is the, the information and the data that you use to, to make your assortment decision and, and your product development decisions, most of them say uh, things like, I look at some beer trends, I look at Nielsen reports, I look at IRI data, um, and, and most of them tell me, well, I just feel the markets, right? I, I'm in touch with my customers. I talk to the people that come to my brew pub or my tap room, and that's what drives me in my decision making. And that is a great, great start, but we think we can do better. Um, and better data means more confident choices. And that starts with, you know, the chemical and sensory analysis that we talked about. Um, but also any other product elements that might have an influence on someone's flavor experience. And so that includes uh, pricing information, that includes information about packaging, information about the name, um, information about, you know, how, how it's sold, right? Uh, if a beer is sold in a, in a can versus in a large uh, wine size bottle, that might make a difference in the in the flavor experience of a consumer. Um, and even more, you need to start getting insights about that consumer too. Um, trying to understand, you know, what that consumer has already tasted and how they liked it. Um, uh, the flavor preferences that they that they typically have, but also, you know, who they are. You want to know uh, or we want to know as much as we can about that consumer as possible, because that allows us to to really drill down and personalize the recommendations that we're, that we're making for them. Um, and obviously on the product side, uh, and I never give a presentation without Kevin's face in it, um, I, uh, we start with that chemical and sensory analysis. And that's, that's really one of the most comprehensive flavor analyses that, that we have and, and that we can do. Um, and then, as I said, we add that product data as well. Um, on the consumer data, uh, we really want to exp we want to get an, an insight in for every consumer tasting a beer or tasting a wine. We want to know what stood out for them. What do they remember about their experience? Because that's the data point that's really going to drive us um, in in their next recommendation. Uh, and that goes beyond what they tasted. Uh, obviously, we want to know if they taste if they picked up on the bitterness or the the sweetness of a of a beer. But we also want to know where they were drinking. And, you know, having a beer in the summer or in the winter can be a totally, totally different experience. And so that's something we want to take into account. But also, even going further, we want to make sure that um, we take into account the psychology of a consumer. And so I always like to talk about the, the Proust effect. Um, uh, Proust, the French philosopher, that, that told a story and wrote a story about uh, the Madeleines, uh, the Madeleine cakes that his grandmother made for him when he was a kid. And so every time he came home, 
and someone made madeleines, he immediately had a very, very strong appreciation for whatever he was eating or drinking just because he had that link to his childhood. And, and so that's something that if you want to make good recommendations, uh, you have to take that into account as well. A last element here that we also need to take into account is that um, not only is there an individuality in the flavor perception and the way we taste and smell, um, but there's also a difference in the way we experience those flavors. And, and so it might be that you taste the exact same thing, uh, but that it feels negative versus positive for someone else. Or also that you that you talk about it in a very different way. Uh, so I always give the example in, in uh, between fruity and sweet. And there is a bunch of consumers that just use those two words interchangeably. And, and they don't even know that there's a difference between the two which is for us to pick up on, and which is one of the big added values of, of being able to compare their language to what is actually in the product chemically and, and in a sensory way. So all this data, all this complexity in the data that we gather, um, that's basically the basis of, of what we build our business on. The question that I always get is how we gather consumer data. And so that's the reason why we work with retailers and why we have a, a, a big part of our business that is that is retailer oriented, um, because we basically help retailers um, offer recommendations to their consumers, uh, to their customers. And so that means that we can build you know, a chatbot or um, an experience into their website uh, that allows them to give the, to put the right product in front of the right consumer flavor wise, uh, but that also allows us to gather a lot of data about those consumers. And, and that's what we then use uh, to do to take the next step, which is, you know, we build an analytics platform that helps you optimize your business. And, and it's, it's really built to give you all the insights in your platform, in your beer and your portfolio uh, on a flavor level but also make that link to the consumer and also understand like your beer is appreciated by your consumer for this and this reason and and getting that kind of actionable data and linking it to not only flavor insights but also branding and marketing insights and and giving you an insight into competition that's basically where we with our platform want to start making the difference in in the future here The insights that we gather from that is really, and, and I don't have to go too much of, into detail about this, but, but it's basically what Kevin showed. It's, um, uh, you, you see that once you start gathering this data and once you have your beer analyzed, that you get a bunch of insights that, that are invaluable. And definitely uh, already just a product analysis is going to give you as a producer a lot of insights, but adding that consumer, uh, that consumer perspective to it um, is going to answer future questions such as, I have a beer, but I don't know what the target market is, or I want to grow my beer, and, and where is the growth, in which audience, in which geography, um, but also how should I talk about my beer, and where should I where should I put my beer in front of a consumer? Is it more of a beer that's that's good for nighttime or summertime or wintertime? And and you can really add your your go to market strategy. Uh, and, and adapt it to the kind of data that you see here and the kinds of insights that you get from our platform. And really important to me and, and I think to Kevin as well is that um, we, we want to even the playing field. And so we want to make sure that this kind of information and this kind of insights um, are available to you know, as many brewers as possible. Uh, and that means that it starts by offering the flavor analysis that we do at a very affordable price um, and getting a really, really detailed analysis for a price that, that you know, is manageable. Um, a second element is that we want to make sure that you have and, and retain access to our platform, which gives you dynamic, continuously changing market information. Um, and, and that allows you as a brewer to make better decisions. And that's that's what it's all about in the, in the end. Um, and then a third big, uh, big goal of us is that as we work with both retailers and producers, 
we're also gonna gonna become a platform that links the two. And so we give insights to retailers as well, where we can tell them like, look, your consumer base is very uh, very sensitive to this kind of beer. And here is a bunch of beers that we already have analyzed that are not in your assortment yet, but that you really should try out because they're gonna match really well with the flavors of your consumer. Um, so that's, a, that's a, a product that we're working on really hard to be able to give you that. Um, and then the last element there is that we really want to showcase beer flavor to consumers as well. And as Kevin said, the, the book that he and, and his lab published uh, two years ago, I think, or three years ago, uh, was the start of that. And our goal is definitely to start uh, to continue that tradition and, and to do it in the U.S. as well, uh, but also try to find other ways to really put those new and exciting flavors in front of consumers, because that's that's in the end, uh, you know, one of the one of the big goals here. And then I want to end up and and we'll make sure I saw the, the comment by Doug here. Uh, if Kevin will share his deck, uh, I think I can tell you for my deck that that's no problem um, and that we're also happy to share more data um, and, and more uh, information. But if you would be interested in um, sending your beer and, and participating in the program that we're setting up, um, then let us know. Uh, we have an, an early adopter program that ran until the end of December, but uh, uh, because a lot of breweries said, told us like, well, maybe we want to decide in January, we decided to extend it to the, till the end of January. Um, and so what you can do is sign up uh, via the email address here, contact at esther.ai. Um, and then what we'll do is get you onboarded. Uh, the, the price per beer analysis today is at $9.99. Um, and if you want to send more than one beer, uh, please let us know because we have some nice, nice volume discounts that we can offer you. Um, and what we'll ask you to do is ship them to New York. Uh, and then from New York, we will make sure that the testing gets done as soon as possible. Um, and, and what you get for that is, as I said immediately, uh, the, the product analysis, um, including a download of the raw data, if you would, would want that. Um, and then you get access to the platform in the, in the early adopter program forever for free uh, with the current capabilities. Uh, that's really, really important because the platform is going to be continuously evolving and continuously adding new beers and features. And so you'll be one of the first ones to, to be there. Um, on top of that, we're also planning to, to do a bunch of showcasing um, and, and, you know, hopefully we'll be able to publish a book in, in the summer of 2021. Um, and hopefully we'll, we'll also be able to launch a consumer driven website that will feature the beers that, that have participated in this early adopter program. So, uh, that's kind of the, the opportunity there. If you would be interested, then please just, uh, let us know if you have any additional questions, let us know. Um, because in the end, the goal that we all have and the goal that we really want to get to is that we want to make sure that that brewery that makes all these amazing beers and doesn't put them in the market because he finds it too risky, that some of that risk is taken away. And then instead of one out of 60, we'll have maybe 10 or uh, 15 new beers in the market, which is, which is good for all of us, actually. All right, so that's the, uh, you know, the intro or the, let's put it that way, the, the introduction of what Esther does based on the research and the work that Kevin has done. Um, and so we would be happy to, I think, Kevin, maybe you can weigh in on that to share the deck. I think that's not a problem. Um, and then I want to, um, I think we have another 10, 15 minutes. So I'm happy to open open up the floor for any questions that might come uh, from the audience, um, I know that, uh, you know, uh, Andrew had a couple of questions that he already received, um, and here he is. So the question there is, um, what made you go into beer science, fermented beverage science, and where does your love for the product come from? And so I'll, I'll be happy to have Kevin answer that question first. Uh, <laughs> I got into the beer science through wine, to be honest. Um, I'll try to cut it short. I was supposed to develop new drugs. That was my, you know, my destiny in life. But I ended up doing my master's thesis in South Africa in a wine lab. 
got really intrigued by by yeast, wine yeast, but then coming back to Belgium, not so much wine here. So did a PhD on, on beer yeast and beer aroma. And then learned more and more, became part of the tasting panel, learned more about beers uh, and how they're produced. Uh, started talking to brewers, really got into it, then spent six years in the US. Not working so much on beer, except when I set the lap up at Harvard, actually I started teaching beer brewing to first years, to fresh freshmen, which was a whole challenge by itself. We visited some of the local Boston breweries then. And then when I got when I moved my lab back to Belgium, it really took off. And um, we really went from yeast genetics to, to being also a beer yeast lab, uh, working with lots of breweries, big ones, but also small ones. And um, yeah, so it's it's a continuing story. It was there wasn't a big plan behind it, but uh, the more the more you learn about it, the more you get into it, I guess. And and I just rolled into it. Yeah, yeah, that's fascinating. I think for me, it's always been uh, the 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 complexity you can create with uh, a couple of simple ingredients, and and just by you know tweaking those ingredients, and 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 the fact that you make. Uh, you make a, such a different end product with the same four ingredients has always been kind of my uh, the reason why I've been so fascinated in uh, with uh, with beer and, and wine as well for that matter. Um, and then I'm a geek, so I just wanted to understand the science, and so <laughs> decided to go into into food science and then beer science in the end. Any other questions? Uh, feel free to put them in the chat. I know that um, uh, the last time I did the session, it was kind of hard for people to find that chat. So we'll give you a minute or two. Um, but I'm happy. We're happy to to answer any more questions. Um, another one that Andrew is sharing from someone in the audience. Um, maybe that's one for, for Kevin. Huh? So how can this chemical sensory analysis be used in your opinion by a brewer? Um, how are brewers going to use this? Yeah, that's a very good question. The, the first thing I should say is there's no way that, that this artificial intelligence is going to replace brewers or we're not at the level where, you know, artificial intelligence is going to develop uh, brewing recipes. Actually, it is something we'd like to try, but more as a gimmick than, than really. I think you still need the art of, of, of being a brewer and understanding. But um, it can help you understand your current product and maybe help you understand, you know, maybe weak spots or, or things you could change, maybe not make better, but different, uh, to make a new variant that is going to be loved by part of your consumers um, or one that is not out there yet right um, so in that sense i think it can help you to understand your product better it can help your consumer to understand his or her preferences better and it can hopefully allow you to make better products or or new products that's mm -hmm. that's dream. and and it's really working i mean we see this with some of the breweries we're, we're working with uh, for the moment and and many of the really big breweries um are are investing in in such programs by themselves right um, so it's clear that there, there, there's some value in this. Fascinating. Thank you. Uh, that's a, hopefully a good answer to that person's question, right? Um, I have another one here from Rich, and, and I'll pass it on to you as well, Kevin. Is um, Rich, thank you for the question. Um, the question is, what technology do you use to analyze the beers? Um, it's, there's nothing world shocking there. There's just gas chromatography, gas chromatography coupled to uh, mass spectroscopy, so GCMS with SPME. If you, I don't know what level of expert you are, um, with SPME to get higher uh, sensitivity. Um, we use some enzymatic assays. We have a liquid chromatograph to analyze the sugars. And then we have the Anton Parr, you know, for, for gravity and alcohol. So um, we capture most of the volatile and semi-volatile molecules plus the sugars. Um, yeah, I guess the, the secret is a little bit that um, we have enough of these different machines so that they're all optimized for different categories of flavors. And we have auto samplers um, and pipelines that, that allow us to do this a bit more quickly. It's still quite costly, right? I mean, there's a reason why, why Jean is, is charging you what he is charging you. It, it is still quite a bit of an effort 
to go beyond, let's say, the standard analysis that, that everybody can do for, for, I don't know, 50 bucks or so, uh, to really go into these 200 compounds. It, it really takes some time, but we, with, with our robots and our, our, our scripts, um, we can get the throughput higher. But the, the technologies we're using are state of the art, but nothing really new. It's not like we're developing our own new technologies there. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, and then next to that, there is also the sensory analysis, right? Uh, which is uh, the the trained the trained lab panel. Right. So there we have a, a panel of of twenty trained people, members of the lab actually. But that's good because they're from all over the world. Uh, you know, um, different ages and and gender. So so in a way, it's a good panel. And of course, they've been selected. We we had many candidates. <laughs> Everybody wanted to be part of the tasting panel. But of course, we did tests, and uh, and we, we we didn't allow the people who were awful tasters, or we we allowed them to continue in the training program. Anyway, uh, and then we set up our own uh, sheets. Actually, everything is online in the tasting panel, so they have uh, iPads um, to just have a very quantitative tasting, and we take extra measures, as most tasting panels do, right? But we we I think go an extra mile to standardize everything and to keep teaching our panel because. It is so important for us that we get quantitative data also on the taste, and, and it's really difficult to do. So we test our panel continuously, giving them the same beers in different weeks and seeing how well they do. Um, and I guess, yeah, that really gives us quantitative tasting data as well. And that's something you need to, to link the chemistry to the flavor. You need quantitative data, uh, something that a computer can work with. Um, so that's something we've also invested in uh, a little bit. Yeah, cool. Thank you. Um, good. Any other questions in the meantime? I see nothing new showing up in the in the chat. Um, ah, look at that. Uh, so here is another question sent through Andrew. Um, what are the biggest differences between American and European beers? How do they stack up to each other? And is there an opportunity for American beer in Europe? <laughs> I think so. Uh, <sighs> One thing that comes to mind, but but don't feel insulted because it actually is a is is a compliment. I think the American brewers are maybe now where the Belgian brewers were maybe 200 years ago. But but let me explain the compliment because it sounds like it's an insult. What I mean by it is that Belgian brewers used to be extremely adventurous, right? And I think that that gave us this wealth of, of Belgian beers that we've become famous for. But then somehow they became a bit more traditionalist, weirdly enough. And I think in the US now, and I'm not saying this because I'm talking to the US audience, huh? I say the same thing in Belgium or anywhere. Um, clearly, you guys are the ones that, that are now the adventurous brewers um, with, of course, the craft revolution. And I must say that, and then John will, will also testify to this, um, maybe 10 years ago, about the time when I moved my lab from the US, back to Belgium, I noticed that brewers here were not taking the American beers quite seriously. It's like oh, all these, you know, crazy beers, crazy bitterness, uh, just more hops. It's just, it's not real beer, blah, blah, blah. Um, but they've changed their opinions, right? And so it's, it's really true now that, that the Belgian brewers, and to some extent, are following the example set by the US brewers, especially, of course, with the American IPA styles. Um, but even pumpkin beers and things, you start seeing that uh, coming up here. The good thing is that it, that it sparked maybe a renewed wave of uh, innovation here in Belgium too. So now you see some more original stuff coming up, more craft brewers as well. So, but, but shortly, yes, the respect is, is definitely there. And I think Belgian brewers already learned a lot from, from US brewers. Uh, and, and I do think there's also some things that, that we are also still doing quite well with, with some of the beer styles that, that are interesting for you guys as well, right? And it's, of course, a very mature beer market here in Belgium because we're, we're used to when you go to a pub for ages, uh, not just the past 10 years, but for as long as people can remember, you go to a bar and there's at least 30 beers, right? Uh, Belgium will never go to a bar or will, will look very weirdly if, a, if there's less than 30 beers and each of them have their own glasses and things like this. So in that sense, it's a very mature market, and, and I think there's definitely also lessons that from that that could be interesting for the U.S. market. 
Yeah, I, I definitely agree uh, that there is a, a lot to be learned from each other and that there is a lot of opportunity uh, both for American brewers in, in Europe uh, and vice versa as well. So so totally, totally agree with that. Um, thanks a lot. So I, I want to sign off with uh, one last question for you, Kevin, and that's which beer are, are you drinking? I noticed before that you were uh, having a beer, so <laughs> can't stand uh, to ask the question. A good one. <laughs> okay, that's good. That's enough. Um, oh, we have another question from uh, Rich, the last one. Is, so can you share a sample analysis? Um, we do some GCMS and would love to see how data is translated. In the past, I've worked with GCO to put pieces of beer aroma in the noses of taste panel. Um, Definitely, Rich. Uh, I think uh, we can definitely help you with that. So, what I would uh, what I would say is to uh, get in touch with either Kevin or me uh, over email. You get the, the easy way is uh, to to call uh, or to email. Sorry, uh, contact at esther.ai, and then that email will get into my mailbox, and I'll get you uh, as 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 an answer as quickly as possible. Um, and then we have another one from David. So. I think we have time for one more, right? So considering how many variables there are which affect fermentation performance, I wonder when machine learning will help to troubleshoot brewing production issues. Mm -hmm. yeah, I know you have an opinion on that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's definitely also a very good one, right? Uh, testing ingredients and, and seeing if, if we can make sense of that. Um, it's not something we're looking into at this point, but it's crossed my mind. One thing we are doing is trying to, to get the gushing under control and getting easier, quick tests for gushing. I'm not sure if that's also a big problem in, in the US. It is in Belgium with the re-fermented beers. Um, but stuck fermentation is not something we've looked in so much, but yeah, I, I think it could. I mean, if you have enough data, artificial intelligence will solve all the problems in the world. Um, at least, it will help you model them. Solving them is, is yet another thing. So uh, things are not always that easy, but uh, it could help us a little bit at least. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. Um, I think we're going to leave it at that for this session today. Um, I really, really uh, can't thank you enough, Kevin, for making time this late in the evening. Uh, I appreciate you coming on and, and giving us uh, that introduction and answering those questions. So um, well appreciated. Uh, and then again, anyone else who uh, was interested or got some interest through this session, feel free to reach out and uh, we'll be happy to, to try and help you out. So with that, I'm going to say goodbye and uh, we'll leave it at that. Have a good evening. Bye, Kevin.